this chart now, this chart sort of brings us and makes some things easier, other things harder. The problems that it does have, I don't actually care about. For much of this time, of time and this dog, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. We all know Unix is reliable, solid, blah, etc. This is taken as given for this audience, and that's what's on my desk, or on various desks, and remote desk I'm going to do. OBSD workstation, which does pretty much everything. And the Windows PC, that whenever I use it, I find out it's rebooted itself for some random reason. Everything is done on the OpenBSD workstation. I have over 100 different commands in my prompt tab, which actually get run at various points, which is a ridiculous amount of stuff going on. You could do this in any language. C plan is really useful, which is why I use Perl and yeah, see the last week. I spent, I, I primarily work in a technical team of one as an academic research support person. It doesn't matter to academics how I solve the problems they give me, as long as I, can, I do, and they can write their papers. Academics are generally experts in very narrow fields, <coughs> and working that way has advantages, but when it's outside that field, in the big realm of, on the map that they call technical, it ends up on my desk. I am responsible for the department, and while working this way has advantages, I don't need to just define why, it's written, why this script is written in Perl, not something else. Results matter a lot more than the process, but if it breaks, I'm going to have to fix it. So longer term reliability is far more important. If it's going to be running for that amount of time than temporary solutions, if it breaks, I fix it, and I'm generally expected to either have the answers or find it and tell people and pretend I did. Most of the other technical people around the other organizations who my projects work with are Windows-based programmers. They know VB, they know ASP, and they know I run this thing called Unix, and they don't quite understand what it is. That includes all the people whose web servers I've worked to. Most of what we do, every 80 percent is now web-based, as pretty much everything if you're doing support is <coughs> sending things to web pages so that people stop asking you questions. I have very little ability to influence their time, direction, and getting additional steps in their processes is hard. So I have webs, I have private web servers where we can do back-end services, but the stuff we publish on flyers, on posters, has to have one of their URLs on it. That's something we can't post back to our web servers, but the front end is theirs. To understand Unix is to see the world in a very specific, slightly mad way. It's very, very useful for problem solving. And the architecture and design of Unix is designed to solve that sort of problems and has been for 30 years. We have small pieces losing the job. Um, Windows and the Windows way of thinking. The Windows and Windows way of thinking and the Windows admin and the Windows programmers, the people we work with are very good. They think of one large problem to do everything, which means it does everything but not anything particularly very well. And the important thing that everyone in this room and everyone at this conference has that most people on this planet don't is an incredibly diverse set of hugely powerful tools. We may say Perl looks like line noise, and if you've seen my code, it does, but if all you want is a one line script to run once, who cares? You're the only person who's ever going to write it, and nobody's ever going to read it. We spend a huge amount of time piping this stuff from those scripts into anything. Piping things into less, the breadth, the redirection of standard in, the redirection of standard out, the concept of standard error. Windows is getting some of those with PowerShell, but how many Windows admins and Windows users do you know that even know they exist, let alone that can actually use them and use them well? Who here has ever downloaded Acrobat Adobe PDF Reader? Anyone give real information? Okay. Everyone puts junk into forms, um, and if you actually care about the answers, often you have to process them. Um, now, we don't have anything like that number of data, that number of rows, but we have 
forms that people sometimes put, stuff that makes some sense in. In the UK, for example, there are a number of ways of writing a postcode. Unlike the US, they're not just numbers. You can have letters, you can have in certain formats. You can have it with or without a hyphen, you can have it with or without a space, you can have it in a full lowercase, and that's just us, how we are in your country, <coughs> or maybe less. Cleaning that all up to going, is this valid, yes, no, is not a hard task for anybody here. You just run them through a script. Um, I once stopped somebody um, doing it one by line in Excel. Which, while Excel only covers 64,000 postcodes, that's still a fair bit of time. For us, it's a, um, it's a function of the time it takes to write the script, not the number of inputs. Of course, if you want to clean up, per, uh, clean up postcodes, there's a Perl module for it. And if it's a Perl module for it, it's important. It doesn't exist reliably elsewhere. Um, Linux, you have all the different repositories, you have all the different parts, some freeware has some strange compile time options, which most of the time will work. If it's there, you're sorted. If you're not, you're pretty much on your own. It is very much easier to port a piece of software and have it installed in the port tree. You write a make file, everything else pretty much looks out for itself. And once you have port upgrades, <coughs> you know that if you upgrade the software, the port will be updated and you can not worry about it. If you install it for yourself, you upgrade it, you upgrade everything the interface has changed, but your custom digital software doesn't work anymore. Um, also, the part of stuff on my machine is from ports, and it all keeps itself updated, which is worth the initial effort, and when I didn't port it, I later regretted it. It all works principally thanks to the OpenBSD porters, and it's useful. And if you don't have Real port upgrades. Who here uses one variety of other port upgrade scripts on their machines, production machines? About halfish. If you don't know and you don't trust it, when you know, when you believe, and when you really, really trust that port upgrades will work, it'll either upgrade or it won't. And if there's a problem, it won't upgrade and it will tell you why. Upgrading becomes much less of a problem. It's not scary, it's not turbulent, and it just happens. You shouldn't expect upgrading your systems to break. If you change X, that should just take care of itself. Um, Paul Henning was talking about pipes and bagpipes last night, so I should decide. The tools in ports so are useful if you can get them to work and play together, and that's where pipes help. The ability to join things easily doesn't exist elsewhere, and a lot of the time the concept doesn't exist elsewhere. You talk to a Windows user about piping some or connecting this application to that application, they look at you as if you're talking gibberish. It lets us do very simple things that they can't conceive of. And when you put SSH in there, it goes to a different machine, you can run commands remotely, irrespective of where it is, and there's no more complexity. It's just a stage in the pipe. And um, one of the open SSH developers, or not from that, who calls SSH the Swiss Army Knife Network. And it sits there and it works. <laughs> if anybody's ever tried to explain to somebody how, who doesn't understand pipes, how you use the joint tools together and what it makes possible, it's not easy. And if you've ever done it and succeeded, please tell me how. They let us scale flexibility and our systems scale very quickly and very, very similarly. I work in academia for academics. We don't have many customers demanding things right now, or they'll take their customers elsewhere. Well, some of them demand things right now. <coughs> it's rarely um, that urgent. But we do have some large problems. Our data isn't terabytes in size or a very large digger, um, it is incredibly complicated and it has a lot of subtleties. If you look at, I work for social scientists, so we look at people and environments and interactions between those. If you think about how your hometown or home country 
has changed in the last year, five years, ten years. There are a lot of things that are now important that weren't five years ago. And we deal with data that was collected back then and look at changes. How do you represent that? Alternatively, how do you classify operating systems? Word of computer conference. So the questionnaires which will appear at some point will ask us what operating systems do you use? Windows will be on that. DSX will be on that. BSD, Linux, Solaris, other. Those categories make a lot of sense for most people. But we're a BSD conference, so we classify free, open, net, other. That would be what? Will someone complain that mere BSD is not on the list? What about splitting the Linuxes? And those questions, depending on what question you want to ask, depends on what data you need. And that is the problem I spend a lot of time solving. We have these surveys, they were asked for various purposes, possibly 30 years ago, 10 years before I was born. Yet, how do we know that this will actually provide a useful answer? Um, we do, so we have 30 years of data. And we have 30 years of data. It was collect, if you think about computer systems, those of you who were running them in 19, 71, which is when we first started, when we first had some of this data, and that's what it goes back to. What data files were you using in 1971? Can you still read them? Probably not. But they've been updated, so this data is still real. But 30 years of data, all sitting there in repository, so if you want 1971 information on the labor market, you can go and get it. But this is considered unmanageable. You have 550 plus different data sets across a range of topics across 30 years. How do you deal with that? How do you find what you're looking for? If you're a new PhD student, you don't know where it is, you don't know what's in there, and you have no idea where to start looking. And this was considered an incredibly difficult problem that nobody had a real idea how to solve until I took a crack at it. So, you've got all this data in different formats, but it's all readable. So if you touch <coughs> it, you unpack it, you verify it, you list it, you identify it. At which point, you know what you've got, which was a start. Once you know what you've got, you can parse it, you can convert it, you can clean it up, and you can do other things to it. Once you've got it cleaned up in a standard format, you can use that, that, that output from those scripts as input to more scripts, which transform it and create something like um, 750,000 <coughs> web pages that we ended up creating. Everything there is just a single pipeline. A lot of scripts, a very large amount of code, but it's a single process. And you feed the output of one into another. Exceedingly simple implementation of something we all take for granted and I've taught you don't quite know what I'm doing but it looks like magic. If you're creating web pages you create URLs for them so you can link to them and if URLs follow patterns you can then guess URLs and if you're dealing with data in a pipeline not quite this big but somewhat, you can then know what the output is going to be on another stage. So you can start feeding output from one into another and adding things. All of our documentation, some of it is current PDFs created from Word, bits of it are, are scans or PDFs of TIFFs, of scans of photocopies of original documentation if we're lucky. But the text we can parse, we can run through PDF to text to get the text out and we can look for the keywords. We know what they are, they're variable names. So suddenly we can link to these things down to the page of the documentation that we have from the mid 80s, which you can still find if you know it's there. <coughs> you can start adding more stuff in. <coughs> Getting anything out of, cult, out of national organisations is very really <coughs> difficult if they don't know why you want it. And explaining this process to them, they didn't understand because 
if you don't know that you can chain everything together like that, you have no comprehension that what I just talked about is possible. So, but if it's there and it's in the web, and you can say, well, the stuff you want, you have that you're willing to give us, we'll just drop it into there and give you credit for it. And they go, here you are. It's unlikely that any system exists from which it's impossible to get data. Even if it's screen scraping it, pretending to be a terminal, a green screen, um, you can get something out of it if you can connect to it and get the data. You write a Perl script, you write a Python script, you write C, you, talk, you pass the binary protocol if you have to. But you can generally get stuff out, at which point you can use it as input. This is relatively large, it's relatively new, relatively new for what we're doing in academia, but people who see it, the one thing we've got is, this has never been thought of as being possible, but people are seeing it going, we'd like you to do this, or since you've got that, can we do this? And talking to people about it, or certainly academics about it, means my to do this just keeps growing, because they keep going, now you've got that, can you get this information out of it? in an automated process? Yes. Oh great, now I can do something else. And with, once you've taken that big mess, which looked like 500 things vaguely grouped, and actually you get something simple, and a lot of people now just Google what they're looking for. And previously that's never worked, but if you have a web page, you can access it by that. You, it's indexed by Google, which took a while. But it certainly works and you start attaching other things to other processes. This is fully automated. <laughs> this is fully automated. Uh, we make computers do the tedious stuff. There are common jobs which sit there and run, and they're just look at databases, see what's updated, and throw all the data through here. So when we want to rebuild the whole thing, I keep a single script going, and it's two and a half days later it's finished processing the whole lot. But computer did the tedious stuff and tell us that we need to care. Did somebody else have automated script work to dump out some logs which we put into our log analysis program? Usually it does, but if it doesn't, let me know, and I'll just pretend it worked. I'll just assume it works if nobody tells me it didn't. FreeBSD has a number of scripts which do that. If you see the FreeBSD implement messages, all the MFCs kick off a script which gets looked at. Facebook checking the web page validates every morning. Who in this room would not write a script to do it? Okay, right answer. No, <laughs> everyone would write a script and chronic from 9 o'clock in the morning. Like regression tests, when something breaks, if it's in new interesting ways, you sort of look at what made it break, you fix it, and write a test to make sure that it doesn't break again. Or if it does, you get warned about it. People in this room will write 20 minutes scripts, or so 20 minutes writing a script to save two minutes a day. You save time after a fortnight, why wouldn't you do it? But there are people, maybe who you work with, who cannot do that. They don't know how to write the script and wouldn't know what form was if it came and introduced itself. And for whom you can save a very large amount of hassle if you wanted to. OpenCBS isn't actually usable in the real world yet. I just like the picture. And the person who asked, is there sex in this talk? <coughs> We have a wide, very wide variety of inbuilt tools, CBS being one of them, just sitting there on, on this ready to use. Without licensing hassles or problems, we can have, and in fact do have, reliable version control everywhere. Another piece of critical infrastructure we can build on. If you didn't have CBS subversion or whatever else you'd use, how much of what you do on an average day would be very different? The projects wouldn't work the same way they do for a start. And most people don't have reliable push control. 
once you have the reliable version control of the CVS repository, you can get reliable notifications when anything changes. Every time somebody commits to the FreeBSD repository, a commit message gets sent. If you want to watch and process a file whenever it changes, put the file in CVS, sync it regularly, and wait for the CVS ID to change if you don't want to read them out. If you care about what the change is, read your email. <coughs> if you don't care what the change is, look for the CVS ID. That doesn't need cooperation with any external organizations. If it's a web page, you just want to fetch every however long, and you can then see what web pages they change, and when, if they agree to tell you what sometimes to get, you don't need to wait for them to tell you anymore. As soon as it's there, you see what, what's there now. More importantly, what used to be there, so what changed? Do you care about that change? If they just fix a, well, fix a typo, change the number eight to the word eight, you don't care. If they tell you that um, this data set had an error, and then you probably actually want to do something around that, because your answers might be wrong. Various things I've found. Principally, that talking about this stuff is actually far easier than actually doing it. Having scripts tell you whether things are wrong is far better than remembering to check and far more reliable. That's the main principle behind Magius. Um, for system monitoring, you just want to know when something doesn't work anymore. You don't care that it's working in the machine that it is. We're in the Unix line after all. And doing the automation as much as possible frees up a lot of time that could be spent doing boring stuff. You, also, you don't want to make interesting things, you want to make time consuming things and dull things. And if you've automated it, you can spend it instead looking at pictures of, on the internet. And this is a top hit for interesting on Google. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why, and I probably don't want to know. Different people work in very different ways. They have different strengths, different weaknesses. People we work with, we're usually taking the average of this audience with the technical people. We know how to solve technical problems. We have people we work with who do the things that we don't do, like being nice to users. If we want to use the strengths of the different people, then we can make the total amount of work required to do whatever task it is we spend time doing go down. While you may see a task as hard, irritating, and being nice to users is not necessarily everybody's strengths, there are people who don't have as much deep technical ability, but who quite like being nice to users and take your short answer as to why um, what they're doing is wrong, daft, insane, and translating it into something that you can send back for help desk. You may see that as exceedingly hard, they see it as easy. <coughs> we have fantastic tools that we take for granted. There are things we find easy that other people find very difficult. They have very different tools. What tasks do you not want to do anymore that they could find easier? And if you want to swap that for checking the web page every morning, which you will just spend 30 minutes on write a conscript and fix it when it breaks, or even have it nailed then when it breaks, you can get rid of the stuff you don't want to do and make everybody's life easier. The, many of those common jobs I run check things, many of them update things. Some of these were things that we used to have people do, and we swap the tasks so that the automated task just happened and they could spend their time doing far more interesting things. Women's outside. Thank you to all the people either in the room or not in the room who write the first bits of operating systems, talked about from starting this talk, or just not mentioned at all, but well, you make my job far, far easier and it would be far, far harder without you. Specific thanks to Rob Watson, Paul Encamp, Michael Munson, and all the organisers for the fantastic conference. You've done a hard job very well. I'm going to take a slight detour for a second. UK Unix User Group has been doing conferences for 30 years. Um, we're 30 years old, we've been doing it for that long. 
we've done multiple large conferences a year. They include material, each conference has some proceedings late stuff that's on the web for the last decade, but we've got 30 something years. We have good papers and good content from people like Rob Pike and Kuskit, Koenig and Ritchie, which were given in the late 80s, some of which are still relevant, some of which are still useful, and are still requested because they're not available anywhere else. We have this huge archive and some boxes and cupboards. We're scanning it to people who request it, but if anybody knows a good way of organising this lot as we're going through, if you've done some like this before, or just have a very large pocket and you should give us some time to make it go faster, we're interested in basically figuring out how to do this better, and it's a huge archive. We don't know everything that's in there. Um, there have been talks on pretty much everything for uh, uh, involving Unix for the last 30 years, so we have no idea what's in that. But we're interested in, we're, we are doing this, and if you're interested in either helping or providing assistance, what's well, happening if you were at a conference in the mid 70s that was really, really good and we should prioritise it, let us know and we'll look at what we can do. Um, but if you've done anything remotely approaching this before, um, It'd be appreciated if you told us what we shouldn't screw up because, well, you either did or you realised and didn't. Thank you. Um, any questions? Discussion? Heckling? Thank <laughs> you. 